Hey guys, welcome to the lecture on committees. Your book covers this in a short amount of time. I want to give you a, a little bit more information. To understand the importance of committees, first off, we have to understand the purpose of the state legislature. We see that the state legislature they have three main functions. First, they create laws. That is their job. They pass bills, send them to the governor. Hopefully, the governor signs these bills. We have laws that are now created. The second is appropriations. Appropriations is a legal term for funding. Appropriations, this is the legal means where the state legislature transfers money to whoever they're giving the money to. You know, it could, it could be a state agency, a county, something. But appropriations is simply the legal fund or the legal term to, to move money around. Last, they have oversight. The state legislature passes bills, but they don't implement these laws. It's actually the, up to the executive branch to implement these laws that the state legislature passes. So they have the authority to call people over from the executive branch, have them come testify in front of these committees, let them know what's going on. Is the bill working? Yes or no? If it's not working, what can we do to make it better? What improvements are needed? So that is oversight. Now, let's get into committees. Okay? Committees allow the legislature to have a division of labor. What do I mean by this? Okay, for the legislature, for either chamber, the House or the Senate, to pass a bill, it has to get a majority vote. So 76 members of the House have to approve this bill. 16 members of the Senate have to approve this bill. I say members, but in reality, it's districts. But the majority rules, majority votes to pass to pass a bill in the chamber. Why don't we have all 31 Senate members working on the same thing at the same time? Why don't we have all 150 House members working on the same thing at the same time? This is inefficient. Nothing would get done. So by breaking down to these committees, these smaller, more manageable numbers, it allows for this division of labor, but it allows for specialization. We can get people on these committees that actually know about the area that they're, that the bill refers to. So they have specialized knowledge in this area. The committee acts as a little legislator legislature. What I mean by that, and I just told you that when for a bill to pass the chamber, it has to get a majority vote. For a bill to pass out of a committee, the committee members vote, just like the legislature. For the bill to get out of committee, it takes a majority vote. But let's just go ahead and start getting into the process. A bill is filed in the House or in the Senate. The presiding officer is going to assign this bill to a committee. When a bill is assigned to a committee, the committee can do numerous things. They can debate the bill. They can mark up the bill. By marked up, I mean bills can be rewritten. There can be minor changes. They can make sure that bills are actually substantially altered. They can call witnesses to come testify for the bill. 
can be both sides. They can call witnesses to come testify for the bill, tell us why it's good. They can call witnesses to come testify against the bill, tell us why it's bad. Do you think a bill leaves the committee in the original form that it, it shows up in? Most often not. How come? When you or I write a bill, we have a general idea. This is what we, get, we want to get accomplished. This is our goal. But once we get it to commit the committee, the people who specialize in this area, they know what needs to be done to make this a good bill, and they can work on it. They can make it a good bill. So they are going to change it. So chances are very, very slim that the bill coming out of committee is going to look like the bill that went into a committee. So that's the general idea about committees. But I want to talk about something real quick. A committee is a great place to kill a bill. Committees are often used to kill bills. There's two ways that I want to discuss. The first way is a presiding officer assigns a bill to a committee. There are numerous committees out there. Does the presiding officer have to assign a bill to the proper committee? No, he doesn't. He can assign it to any committee, well, he or she can assign it to any committee that they want. What happens if they assign a bill, what happens if they assign a transportation bill to a health care committee? Do you think the health care committee is going to work on it? No. Why not? They don't know anything about it. When a bill is sent to a committee and the committee does not work on it for whatever reason, this is called pigeonholing. Pigeonholing. The bill is not worked on, it's stuck in committee, it is pigeonholed in there simply means the committee never does any work on the bill, so it never leaves the committee and comes up for a vote. Another way that a bill can die in committee is something called tagging. And it is important for you to understand that tagging can only occur in the Texas Senate. Tagging is a senatorial procedure. House cannot do it. Tagging is only in the Senate. Any senator is allowed to tag a bill one time. One, one senator, one tag per bill. The senator tags a bill. This means that we're going to delay hearings on a bill for up to for 48 hours. We're going to delay any work on a bill for two days, for 48 hours. The senator only has to notify the committee chairman that he or she wants to tag a bill. They want 48 hours advance notice before any hearings are held. Any work done within this 48 hours is void. It is null and void. It doesn't count. How would tagging allow a bill to die? I mean, it's one senator two days, what's the big deal? Remember, I've already asked you, do you think most work gets done at the beginning, the middle, or the end of the session? Say there's two weeks left in the session, there's two days, and a senator says, I want to tag this bill, no work is done for, for 48 hours, for another two days. So, two weeks, 14 days, now we're down to 12 days. Well, then a friendly senator tags the same bill. One tag per senator, but multiple senators can tag the same bill. So the second senator comes up and tags this bill. Once those two days are up, we're down to 10. 
third senator comes up and tags, we're down to eight. Fourth senator comes up and tags, we're down to six. Do you see how this could kill a bill? Tagging is a very effective way to do it. Why would an elected official, why would a member of our state legislature want a bill to die in committee? Why would a senator want to tag it? As an elected official, do you want to vote on every bill that you possibly can? Simple question. We sent you to Austin to vote to make these hard decisions. Do you actually want to do it? The answer, usually not. You usually don't want to vote on everything you can because something you're going to vote on, some issue, is going to be very divisive. Your, your district, your constituents, half of them are going to like it, half of them aren't. Now, for most of our elected officials, once they become an elected official, they have one goal. That goal is to be reelected. How do they get reelected? By making their constituents happy. If there's a bill that half of their district doesn't like, you know, like 51%, 52% is for it, 48, 49% is against it. Does the elected official from that district want to vote on this bill? The answer is no. Why not? Because you don't get reelected by making half of your district, by making half of your constituency mad. So if you will go out of your way to make sure that these bills don't come up for a vote. You may ask a committee chairman, Hey, please don't work on this. Let it die in your committee. If you're a senator, you may tag it. Does that mean that if a bill is stuck in a committee, there's nothing that can be done? No, it doesn't. There's something out there called a discharge petition. The discharge petition is simply a way to rescue bills from being pigeonholed in committee. If somebody files a discharge petition, it is going to have this bill brought out from committee without committee vote, without any committee input, and it is going to go to the floor of whichever chamber for a vote. Do we often use discharge petitions? No, we don't. And the reason is, using a discharge petition tends to make a mockery out of the committee function, out of the committee system. Now, remember, committees, they're supposed to specialize. They're supposed to have expertise in this area. We send it to a committee so they can tell us if it's a good bill, if it's a bad bill. Hopefully, they can make the bill better. But if they don't work on it, and we file a discharge petition, we are asking the rest of our chamber to vote on a bill that we know absolutely nothing about. The committee had no input. They didn't say anything. So do we know if this is a good bill or a bad bill without committee input? We don't know. It could be the best bill in the world. It could be the worst bill. Now, let me ask you, as an elected official, do you want to vote for this bill? Mm, probably not, because chances are good it's going to be a bad bill instead of a great bill. So, yeah, we do have the discharge petition. It's rarely used because it puts everybody in a bind. I want to talk about something called the calendar. 
The calendar is used for controlling the flow of legislation from committees to the floor. I'm going to start off with the House of Representatives because they are a tad bit more, not difficult, but comprehensive. In the Texas House of Representatives, there are four types of House calendars. The first is the Daily House calendar. This contains a list of new bills, resolutions, that are scheduled by the Committee on Calendars, or the Rules Committee, I'll talk about them in a minute, for consideration by the House. This calendar must be distributed to the members 36 hours before the House may consider the, those measures on the calendar. So basically, the Daily House calendar, this is going to be new business business that we're going to discuss within the next couple of days. The second type of calendar is called the Supplemental House Calendar. The Supplemental House Calendar. It's going to contain old business. It may be something from a previous day. It was postponed. It wasn't reached for consideration for, for whatever reason. Maybe the bill, there was a call to table the, to bill. Who knows? But the supplemental house calendar is going to be old business. The fourth calendar, excuse me, I'm sorry, the third calendar is the local comma consent comma and resolutions calendar once again that's the local comma consent comma and resolutions calendar this contains a list of local or non-controversial bills scheduled by the committee the fourth calendar is something called the Congratulatory and Memorial Calendar. This calendar contains a list of congratulatory and memorial resolutions or motions that are scheduled. You know, you might be wishing if, the, if, a, team, if a Texas sports team does well, they win a championship, you know, you're wishing them good luck or you're wishing them well, congratulations that they won, something like that. But those are the four house calendars. Now we're going to move on to the Senate. The House uses four calendars. How many calendars does the Senate use? Go ahead, think about it, look at it, take a guess. If you guess any number other than one, why? Look what it says. Senate calendar. Calendar, that's singular. Senate uses one calendar. Now, Senate rules state that all bills must be discussed in the chronological order that they are placed on the calendar. And this is a big deal. Senate, the Senate rules state that the bills can only come off the calendar in the numerical, the chronological order that they were placed in. Now, remember, when these bills are, are being filed in the House, they're going to different committees. So, and the committees are going to work at them, maybe, on different time frames so that we can see Senate Bill 35 is passed by their committee before Senate Bill 17, Senate Bill 12, whatever. So however it goes on the Senate, Senate calendar. It's going to start off with one. I'll explain that in a second. Well, actually, it doesn't even have to. 
but your Senate bill, say it starts off with one, 17 was the next bill that was done, 35 after that. So Senate Bill 1, once again, this is an example, this has to be taken off the calendar. It has to be debated and voted on, passed or failed, whatever it is. Once that is done chronologically, we could move to Senate Bill 35. Once we get 35 taken off the calendar and disposed of, Senate Bill 17, then, then whatever. I use Senate Bill 1 as a number just because it's easy. We always think of number 1 as the beginning. But whatever number it is, the first, ha the first bill on the Senate calendar is going to be called a blocking bill. The first bill placed on the Senate calendar is called a blocking bill. It usually deals with a proposed horticultural change. So plants or flowers may have to do with flowers around the state capitol, tree in one of the state park, something like that. Whatever it deals with, the first bill on the Senate bill, this blocking bill, will never be voted on. Hence the term blocking bill. It blocks the Senate from moving in this chronological order. Well, wait a second. If the Senate rules state it has to grow in chronological order, and I just told you we will never vote on the first Senate bill, does that mean the Senate doesn't do anything at all? No, that's not what it means. The Senate does get some work done. What has to occur is that the presiding officer so the lieutenant governor asked the Senate for suspension of the rule. A suspension of the rule, simply the lieutenant governor is going to ask the 31 senators to vote for a suspension. He's going to ask permission for just this one time, can we not go in chronological order? He'd, he could say, I'm saying he because right now it's a male, but the lieutenant governor could say, I'd like to request a suspension of the rule. If it passed, I would like for us to d discuss, debate, and vote on Senate Bill 4. If 19 of the 31 senators agree to a suspension of the rule, just this one time, this temporary stop to the rule, 19 of them vote on it, or 19 of them say yes, we suspend the rule, we're going to bypass a chronological order, we bypass the blocking bill, and we get to pull off the bill that the lieutenant governor requested. Why is that a big deal? Suspension of the rule and this chronological order. Well, I told you, blocking bill, that first bill, nobody's ever going to vote on it, but the lieutenant governor has to request a suspension of the rule. So the lieutenant governor is going to be the one that decides which bills the Senate is going to debate, the Senate is going to vote on. Is that power? If he likes the bill, he wants it to pass, he can ask for a suspension of the rule. If he doesn't like the bill, if he doesn't want it to pass, does he have to bring it off the calendar? No. So the lieutenant governor gets to pick and choose what bills the Senate is going to work on. Once again, that's power. The floor. The floor is where members of whichever chamber, the House or the Senate, meet to debate, amend, vote on, and act, pass, or even defeat legislation.
we want to start, I want to start with the house floor, the floor of the house. The floor of the house, this is where all the work is going to be done in this chamber. The legislators who are attempting to get a bill passed are known as the floor leaders when their bill is up on the floor, or whoever has the floor for discussion. This is the floor leader. They will stand up in front of their colleagues and explain the points of bill, answer questions, and in general, speak in favor of the bill. When it comes time to vote, the vote is cast, the vote is recorded. Now, a recorded vote, why is, it, why is a recorded vote necessary? What do I mean by a recorded vote? Vote is recorded and it is posted online. We get to see how our elected officials voted. Why is this a big deal? Well, think about this. If we don't have a recorded vote and our district really wants something to pass, we really want this bill to pass, and the state legislature without a recorded vote doesn't pass it. Our elected representative comes back to our district and says, guys, I'm sorry it didn't pass. I worked hard on it. I wanted it to pass. Send me back to Austin. Next time we'll get it done. And we say, okay, we know you worked on it. We'll, we'll vote for you again. Guys, how do we know if they actually voted on it if there's no record? We don't. Believe it or not, our elected officials may lie to us. Texas, we actually finally figured it out that they lie. It took us a while. We didn't have a recorded vote. We had no way of recording who voted how until we passed Proposition 7, no, excuse me, Proposition 11 in November 2007. This was a constitutional amendment that when it came time to to vote that we actually had a record of how our elected officials voted. Why is this a big deal? Well, if your elected official comes up and says, I voted for it, send me back, we can actually look at their voting record. Are they telling us the truth? If they voted for it, that's great. They did what they said, but if they lied, we can say, hey, wait a second. You're lying to me. You didn't vote for for this bill. You didn't vote in the best interest of this of the district. Why did it take Texas so long to realize this? I don't know. We're Texas. That's all I can say. A point of order, technical. A point of order is simply a formal question concerning the legitimacy of a legislative process. Was the process, were the rules followed? If you're arguing a point of order, a successful argument, a successful point of order, can result in the postponement or defeat of the legislation. Senate. The floor of the Senate. Okay, I want to go back to the floor of the House for a second. Because this is important. Understand the difference. There is a, there is a step. There is a big difference between debate in the House and debate in the Senate. In the House of Representatives, 
a bill starts off in a committee. The committee passes the bill. Before it can be placed on the House calendar, that daily House calendar, it actually has to go to another rule, or to another committee, excuse me. This is the House Calendars Committee or the House Rules Committee. I always refer to it as the House Rules Committee. What happens here? The House Rules Committee has three jobs. First off, they're going to pick a day for debate. They're going to place it on the calendar. They're going to pick a day for debate. Secondly, they get to a lot or they get to grant so much debate time. 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, whatever. It is up to this House Rules Committee. Once debate time is over, once that time is reached, debate's over, the chamber votes. The third thing they do, is this bill going to be open rule or is it going to be closed rule? Open rule means that we can add amendments to it as we're debating it on the House floor. Closed rule simply means we can't. So for the floor of the Senate, committee, then the House Rules Committee, where it does those three things, gives a date, sets a date, sets time, open and closed rule. That date comes, we debate, we vote. Now, the Senate, it operates a lot like the floor of the House. The committee, they'll work on the bill, they'll pass it, it gets put on the Senate calendar. Now, once a bill is brought to the floor, you know, remember to come to the floor, the, the uh, presiding officer, the lieutenant governor, has to request a suspension of the rule. Do we expect a bill to pass the Senate once it is brought to the floor? Simple answer, yes. We fully expect this bill to pass. Why? Think about what I've told you. For a bill to pass a chamber, what is that magic number or what is the magic term? Majority. Out of the Senate, majority is 16. How many senators need to vote for a suspension of the rule, need to agree to take this bill off the calendar and bring it up for debate and for a vote? 19. Now, I'm willing to bet if 19 are willing to take it off the calendar so they can vote on it, I bet they're willing to vote yes. So we do expect these bills to pass once they hit the Senate floor. Does that mean that we don't have any debate on, on the Senate floor? No, we, we have some. And every once in a while, we have something called a filibuster. If you have taken federal government if you have, you know what you should know what a filibuster is. If you haven't, if you pay any attention to politics, you probably still have some idea what a filibuster is. Filibuster basically means unlimited debate. You can talk a bill to death. We find the filibuster in the U.S. Senate. We find the filibuster in the Texas Senate not the House. Remember, the House has a limited amount of debate time, but we find the filibuster in the Texas Senate. Now, at the U.S. level, the federal level, the rules are a little less strict than they are in Texas. 
at the U.S. level, a senator can get up, say this is a horrible bill, you shouldn't vote for it, and then read the dictionary. They get done, they pass off to a sympathetic senator who gets up and says, this is a horrible bill, you shouldn't vote for it. Then they read the phone book. They get done, they pass off to a sympathetic senator, and this can go on and on and on. Basically, the point of a filibuster isn't necessarily that you're trying to kill a bill, you're not trying to necessarily talk it to death, but you're trying to get the author of the bill, whoever created it, to pull the bill back and say, okay, you're going to filibuster the bill. What do you want me to change so that you will allow it to pass? Now, at the federal level, very little restrictions. In Texas, we have more rules than the federal, the national Senate has, the U.S. Senate has. In Texas, you cannot pass off to a sympathetic senator. Whoever starts the filibuster has to end the filibuster. They are able to talk for as long as they can. Nobody else is allowed to get up. They can't sit, stand, or lean against anything. They can't eat anything like that. They have to stay on topic. So we just can't say this is a horrible bill, then read the phone book. We have to continue to say why this is bad. If we believe one of these rules is violated, we can request the presiding officer the lieutenant governor to end the filibuster. If they agree the rule is violated, filibuster is over, let's vote. If they disagree, they say no, the rule wasn't violated, you are allowed to continue to speak. So we, you know, we do have debate in the Senate, not as much in the House, or not, we're not going to have as much debate in the Senate as the House due to the filibuster but we'd still have some. Okay, I'm going to go through this. There's a lot of words, and instead of showing this to you, or going over this, I am going to go show you a picture. This picture is these previous two slides. If you look at step one, we're starting with the Senate. Why? Why not? Because we can. A bill is introduced as Senate Bill Number 13, Step 2. It's assigned to a committee by a lieutenant governor. So Number 3 is going to go to the committee, maybe a subcommittee. We didn't talk about it. But the committee works on it. They call witnesses for or against the bill. They mark it up. At the end, they vote on it. Congratulations, they passed it. It is then put on the Senate calendar, that's number four, where at some point the lieutenant governor asks for a suspension of the rule. The Senate agrees. It goes to step five, the Senate floor, for debate, where it's passed. Well, now Senate Bill 13 has passed through the Senate, but it has to go through the House and it's going to go through the same process. It's introduced as Senate Bill number 13. This is step six. Step seven, Senate Bill 13 is assigned to a committee by the Speaker of the House. Step eight, the committee or the subcommittee does their work, call witnesses for or against the bill, mark it up, finally they vote on it. Now remember, here's the difference. Once they do it, then it has to go to the House Rules Committee. The House Rules Committee decides what day is going to be placed on the calendar, how much time is allowed. That day comes, it comes off the House calendar to the House floor. We debate it. They pass it. So congratulations. 
we have Senate Bill 13 passed by the Texas Senate. We have Senate Bill 13 passed by the Texas House. Now, it cannot move any further. It can't move to the governor's desk unless the House version and the Senate version look exactly the same. What are the odds that this is going to occur? Slim to none. So if we get Senate Bill 13 but two different versions, that's going to be right here, different versions of the same bill. Step 11, this is going to go to a conference committee, and I mentioned those already. Conference committee, members from the Senate are going to meet with members from the House, and they're going to try and negotiate their differences. They're going to try and work out a compromise. Do they have to? Do they have to come to an agreement? No, they don't. A bill, even after all this work, it can die in conference committee. But, hey, they come to an agreement. They, they agree, whatever. This is what we want. This is what we want. So the conference committee report is then sent to the Senate, where it's put on the Senate floor. This revised bill is put on the Senate floor. Do we expect it to pass? Yes or no? Yes. How come? Well, because in the conference committee, we already did our negotiation. We said the Senate could live with this. So the Senate passes it. The conference committee, this new version of the bill, is passed to the House, where, once again, we expect this version to pass the House because we've already negotiated. So then it becomes an act of the legislature, passed by both houses, the exact copy, now we can go step 13. Now the governor can start making decisions on it. I've got a link here. If you've ever watched Schoolhouse Rock, I'm Just a Bill. I first saw this thing back in the 70s. And today this is still the best or the easiest explanation for how a bill becomes a law. Like I said, just substitute Texas legislature for Congress, substitute governor for president, what I say here, there you go. Watch the video. Once it gets to the governor's desk, there are some choices. The governor may sign a bill into law. Doesn't have to. And we're not talking about a veto either. That's something different. Because we're talking about here how it does become a law. So the governor may sign a bill into law. If the governor does, it's going to become a law in 90 days unless there is a specific start date written into the bill. Most bills do have specific start dates. Can anybody tell me what day most bills in Texas go into effect? Does anybody know? That date is September 1st. Most new laws go into effect September 1st. Governor doesn't have to sign it for it to become a law. So a veto, it doesn't become a law, but once again, how a bill becomes a law. So the governor doesn't have to sign it. If he doesn't sign it, if the governor does not sign it, the bill becomes a law in 10 days if the legislature is in session. If he doesn't sign it, it becomes a law in 20 days if the legislature is not in session. So, he may not like it, he or she, the governor, may not like it, but they have to make some decision. They either have to say yes or they say no. If they say nothing, it's still going to become a law. Now, I've been talking to you about the presiding officers, the lieutenant governor, the speaker of the house. And I hope I have 
gotten across my point that these are two of the most powerful people in government. These are two of the most important people in Texas government. Does that mean they can do what they want? They are free to do what they want? Or does something restrain their power somehow or another? Well, we do see that there are restraints on their power. The first is their personality. Are they strong and ruthless? Are they a, it's a my way or the highway type of person? Or are they easygoing and willing to compromise? Which type of person would you rather work with? I would prefer one who's easygoing, who's willing to compromise. Second restraint, the team. The presiding officer must build a team of other legislators that they can count on. This is easier said than done, but this is going to be my very last point, these other legislators. The lobby, the bureaucracy. We haven't talked about them yet, but what do the state agencies want? What do the special interests want? If they want something that goes against what the presiding officer wants, the presiding officer is probably going to give in and does what the lobbyists want, the bureaucracies want, just due to monetary factors. The governor. Now, I've sat here and just told you like two minutes ago that the lieutenant governor, the speaker of the house, are two of the most powerful people in Texas government. Why am I talking about the governor? Why am I bringing him into this, him or her into this? Remember, the governor has the power to veto. So if the lieutenant governor has to twist arms, they have to threaten some of these senators to get these 19 votes to bring it off, to bring the bill off the calendar. If the governor tells the lieutenant governor, I don't like this bill, I'm going to veto it. Bring it off the calendar, that's fine. So he, he twists arms, he gets 19 people, the governor vetoes it. Well, remember, to override a veto, we need 21 senators. We need two-thirds of each chamber. So if you barely got 19 senators to approve it, or to bring it off the bill, or bring it off the calendar, you think you're going to get two more to override the veto? No, you're not. So you have to make sure you and the governor are on the same page. Political climate. Hey, this is us. We finally have something to do with this. We being the people. Political climate is what does the public want? How do they feel about this legislation? An interesting one, political or economic ambition. This is going to be future political or economic ambition. Does the presiding officer want to move up to a higher position in government? Will passing legislation detrimental to big business, some other interest group, Will that jeopardize possible financial support in the future? Remember, what do you need to get elected? You need money. If you're running for office, if you're the lieutenant governor and you want to move up, you want to run for a federal position, you can tell all these interest groups, hey, over the last X number of years, I have passed all these laws to help you financially. Now it's your turn to pay me back. I want you to donate to my campaign. That's political ambition. You're trying to move up. Economic ambition. You're tired of being a presiding officer. You're tired of being the Speaker of the House or, or the Lieutenant Governor. So you decide to retire. You're not going to run for re-election. 
But you tell these special interest groups, you, you tell big business, whoever, energy companies, hey, I'm retiring. I know I won't have the clout that I used to. But I still know people. I still have contacts. I still know the procedures. And I am willing to hire myself out. I'm willing to allow you to use my services for the low, low price of, oh, I don't know, $350,000 a year. You can use my services, my knowledge, and my influence. And big business is going to say, hmm, that sounds like a good deal. You're hired. Last one, and I told you I was going to, I want to talk about this at the end. Other legislators, this is actually the hardest to get for the presiding officer. Now, don't get me wrong. If you do not back your presiding officer, can they make your life miserable? Yes. They can make sure your bill goes to the wrong committee so it doesn't get worked on. They can make sure that you don't get placed on a good committee. They can make sure that you don't get any floor time during a debate. But at the end of the day, who gives you your job? Is it the presiding officer or is it the people? It's the people. It's your district. It's your constituents. What happens if your constituents want something that the presiding officers want? And you have to vote. Are you going to vote the way the presiding officer wants you to? Or are you going to vote the way the constituents want you to? Probably going to vote the way the constituents, your district, want you to. And you will just face the wrath of the presiding officer. So this one's actually very difficult. The presiding officer cannot count on this the entire time. 